Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, September 19th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. It's been a very, very busy weekend, and I had to teach a uh, online class today. And we're getting ready for the screening of the film Hapi, The Role of Economics and the Development of Civilization. There's going to be a special screening of this film taking place on Sunday, September 26th, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. I will be there. You definitely want to be there as well. We're going to be joined in a couple of minutes by Dr. Leonard Jeffries, one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Brilliant historian and scholar, former chair of the Black Studies Department at City College uh, in New York. And Dr. Leonard Jeffries is featured in the film, Hapi. We're going to talk some about uh, African history and the role of uh, economics in the development of civilization, especially African civilization. We're going to squeeze in uh, one or two other topics as well. So welcome to the African History Network show. Now, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's corrects your own behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts or a woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Uh, also, in, in our second hour, we were going to be joined by Professor James Small, but um he, uh, he can't make it there was a scheduling conflict um and what we're going to do is the new documentary hapi the new documentary hapi i mean sorry the new documentary on muhammad ali called muhammad ali is a four-part uh series that uh premiered um tonight on pbs muhammad ali explores the many layers of the greatest of all time did you see it have you heard about it uh in our second hour we'll we'll discuss uh that documentary and uh we'll discuss uh part one of the documentary and uh i mean they uh ken burns and his and his daughter and the producers of the film um they reviewed fifteen thousand photographs uh, of Muhammad Ali and many photographs have never been seen before by the public. They reviewed uh, about 40 years worth of footage. So we'll discuss that also. All right. Uh, sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. The sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. The sign up for our email newsletter. Or visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, also, we'll let you know how you can register for the new 10 week online course that I teach on uh, Saturdays um, that I teach on Saturdays from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968 from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. OK. All right. So uh, I want to jump in. We're going to go ahead and jump into. Uh, this first topic here uh the information about the screening of the film hapi uh visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com we have the information there and it connects you to hapifilm.com for more information and to purchase tickets okay so the hapi film presents a snapshot of our economic history spanning from the dawn of civilization to today it begins by investigating the uh, failure of a consumption driven black economy, the failure of a consumption driven black economy, systematic poverty, disenfranchisement and the decline of entrepreneurship. 
it later addresses its complex problems and the decline of uh, it later addresses its complex problems and provides innovative ideas to successfully compete in a global economy. The underlying uh, theme uh, of the film is the interrelationship between the three essential components of economics, politics, and culture. Economics, politics, and culture. And we're going to have uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries expound on this because he always talks about the pyramid principle. He and Professor Jane Small, when they teach, they always talk about the pyramid principle. So we're going to have them explain that to us as well. Um, the uh, dealing with economics, politics, and culture. So this film brings uh, together some of the brightest minds in psychology, history, and business uh, to explore the big picture, the history of world economic development, and our present socioeconomic uh, conditions. Okay, so we want to welcome uh, back to the African History Network show one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Hotep, brother, how you doing today? to to join uh you and your radio family so that uh we're always ready to to share the knowledge and understanding that we've acquired and uh, my wife and i just came back from a beautiful ceremony one of our uh major persons uh in our extended african family she passed and so the family had her celebration today Oh. And uh, that's uh, one of the difficulties. Uh, of absolutely, the absolutely. Why? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead. Because he has, uh, she was the glue that kept us all together. And she handled these enormous projects that we uh, were about, such as uh, economically purchasing a hotel in Ghana overlooking the slave dungeons mm -hmm. and making it work for 15 years in spite of the fact they had that Ebola for three years and other things. So she was a key helping Brother Smalls, Professor Smalls and myself make our Pan-African program work. Right. And so we, we celebrate her and uh, we're glad that she has been a part of our family now. She's up to with the ancestors, uh, and we hope that she will continue to bring some light and some uh, <laughs> some love uh, to us, uh, Sister Leia. Okay, what was her name? What was her name, Doctor Jeffries? What was her name? Leia, Leia Williams. Leia Williams. Okay. She was a part of, yes, and, uh, she was extraordinary. Her family was involved in, with us. Her grand, her mother. Our children, so uh, well, we try to make the African struggle a family affair. Right. Even though great individuals are needed and uh, leadership can't be always shared, uh, but you have to come at these things with the best that you can bring and then share the struggle uh, with others so they can learn how uh, to participate in this global struggle to restore. Africanness to its highest uh, level, and uh, so that's part of what I call the sacred mission. Right. And that uh, we have. Uh, you know, okay. And, uh, you had mentioned mm -hmm. in passing the pyramid analysis how we want people to deal with systems, and so we pair it with this approach, which, which we call pyramid analysis, which allows us to link economics with politics. And culture, right? And uh, but, uh, we got we sat at the foot of the masters for so many years, and we benefited from their knowledge and experience. Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Uh, John Jackson, Dr. Chester Williams, and others, and so we passed that knowledge down to generations up under us, and so. In the African tradition, that's how knowledge is transmitted from mouth to ear, and uh, and it's and a, a bond of, of the generations. And uh, so we need to replicate some of that. 
Right. Individualism has its place, but communalism produces um, benefits for the larger family and not just the individual. Right. Well, you know, I just got off the phone with uh, Professor Jane Small before coming on to the uh, show uh, today, uh, and uh, he was at the funeral as well. Um, so uh, let's do this. We, we, we're coming up on a break here in six minutes, but let, let's do this um, with the with the pyramid principle, because this plays right into the film and the uh, uh, one of the main themes dealing with the film Hapi. Uh, and they deal with uh, three essential components of economics, politics, and culture. And uh, you and uh, Professor Jane Small are two of my teachers, so I learned from you all about the pyramid principle, and I, I deal with this in a lot of my presentations. So you talk about, and I have a picture of uh, the pyramid of Khafre, uh at Giza up here on the screen uh, for people to see, but you talk about how it's African history and culture that gives us our foundation, our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. And then the other two sides of the pyramid are economics and politics. Tell us how these three come together. Because we have, you say we have to have a synthesis of all three of them. That's what you've been teaching us for 50 years. Well, tell us how these come together and the importance of each one of these elements. Well, in order for us to trust this knowledge, in order for us to use the knowledge uh, to build, in order for us to think through what is needed, not just for tomorrow, but for a hundred years from now. <clears throat> you have to have a systems capability. Yes. You have to appreciate systems. Uh, we, for example, have a human body, which has many interlocking systems. And if you don't uh, handle those systems properly, uh, you're not going to be able to continue to nourish uh, your various parts. You're not going to continue to renew and uh, rebuild parts that are devastated or destroyed. And so systems becomes the key. And in dealing with systems, I try to tell folks, think in terms of a beginning. And so you you have a, a, a beginning that's the thesis, uh, but that thesis can't stand alone. It, it, it is complemented by its opposite. Uh, and so you have thesis and synthesis, you know, and that relationship between opposites is finalized by synthesis. So you have to see the synthesis of differences and different circumstances as a part of what you are all about. So it may scare people when you're trying to use some important terms. But the concept of a beginning, a thesis, that's the foundation. And that foundation is complemented by the law of opposites. When you look at the human family, you have the law of opposites. You have the male principle and the female principle. Right, right. Complementary. And then you have that from the relationship between the male and the female uh, when they when they produce a child. That's the synthesis. So life is in relationship uh, with these laws of our opposites and these other high principles that you can see when you look at the Nile Valley. And that's why it's so important for us to be able to look at the Nile past the images that we've inherited, and the image of uh, a Cleopatra in the movies. Right. <laughs> and, and images like lost pharaohs in the movies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and unfortunately, that is complemented by Tarzan in the movies. Uh, a white man born in the jungle flying across the jungle with uh, uh, right. which is cheetah. They didn't even give him a, an African young partner. Mm -hmm. They gave him cheetah. And so the negative imaging of our world experience needs to be counteracted. And that counteracting is so uh, crucial uh, because uh, it is still being renewed. It, it, it's not going away. It's being reinforced. Uh, okay, you, you out of here? Yeah, I'll scratch you on. I'm looking to you on my phone. Scratch you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is that Brother Mitchell? Brother Okay. Yes, 
Okay. Okay. It's true because uh, if you don't sleep and you don't rest and you're working hard like I am, mm-hmm. uh, we were we were dealing with Nigeria yesterday, and the university students, hundreds of them, were sworn into the UNIA African Communities League. So Marcus Garvey's influence and impact is being renewed and extended by hundreds of students in Nigeria. Wow. And so uh, I was involved with, with them, and it was unbelievable. And the head of the UNIA, the current uh, uh, president, Michael Duncan, uh, both he and I were on together. Okay. And, uh, set up a research institute. All right, hey, all right, Dr. Jeffries, let's do this. We're coming up on a break, so just just hold the line, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. All right, everybody, uh, we're speaking with Dr. Leonard Jeffries. He's featured in the uh, film Hapi, the role of economic development in uh, African civilizations and civilization, and there's a screening of the film taking place Sunday, September 26th. 3 p.m. at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Um, we'll talk about that when we come back from the break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by. Stand by. Back from breaking four minutes. Stand by. All right, were you all able to hear Dr. Jeffries? Um, stand by, back from breaking, back from breaking three minutes. Stand by, everybody. All right, who still needs to register for the uh, new 10 week online course that I teach on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have the information right on the home page. You can register there. Okay, you all could. Were y'all able to hear Dr. Jeffries? You may have to refresh your screen or something like that. Were y'all able to hear Dr. Jeffries? The Super Station, the oldest radio station in town since 1922. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, September 19th, 2021, and we are live. We're speaking with Dr. Leonard Jeffries. We're talking about the uh, film Hapi, which deals with the role of economic development in uh, African civilization and civilization. Okay, Hapi, the role of economics and development of civilization. There's a screening of the film P taking place on Sunday, September 26, 3 p.m. at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Uh, there'll also be a panel discussion, um, and I'll be moderating the panel discussion. We'll have the director of the film, Taiki Grant, uh, here 
we'll have uh some local powerful people from the community um as well on the panel uh we'll have um we'll, we'll announce those in just a minute here uh, but visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com we have the information there right on the home page and we have a link to hapifilm.com uh, hapifilm.com uh, and you can purchase tickets okay so it's a screening of the film and a um uh, we have a screening of the film and the panel discussion also okay and uh on the panel we'll have brother Mal uh, maliki kenny and um uh, also uh chef neza of paradise foods uh, brother maliki kenny your kenny of uh, d town uh, farms and also chef neza okay uh let's go back to uh dr Leonard jeffries okay dr j so right before the break we were talking about uh, how economics and uh, African history and culture, as well as politics, have to come together, and how we have to have a synthesis of of those. So, uh, tell us, how did you get involved in this film, um, Hapi, H A P I, for those that don't know Hapi, and uh, that's one of the original names of the Nile River. But how did you get involved in this film? From my early childhood, I've been involved in in uh, in Africa mm -hmm. and, uh, and African peoples wherever they are. Uh, this was something that uh, I have to give credit to uh, my mother, who was uh, came up from Virginia uh, to New Jersey, but, but she came up not with an empty head or empty heart. She had her father, my grandfather, whose birthday I was born on, January the 19th, 1937. He was born January the 19th, uh, 1888, the year before Marcus Messiah Garvey. Mm -hmm. But my mother had crafted for my brother and I uh, uh, a foundation for growth and development. And, and it was not the usual children's foundation of Dick Jane and Spot, Little Red Riding Hood and the Seven Drawers and all of that mess. Our problem was Booker T, Booker T. Washington, W.E.B., W.E.B. Du Bois, and Marcus Messiah Garvey. And so since they were Garveyites, Booker T. Uh, Washington led the way in opening up this new education, the education for building and not education just for a degree. Right. And of course, Garvey said that we're African peoples wherever we are. And so, as a youngster, I had to, I have a chapter in my book. It's going to call. It's going to be called "Where's the Funk." Right. Uh, their, their 
mentors teaching the Greeks and the Trojan War between the Greeks, et cetera. And with that, the, the old teacher, she was an outstanding teacher. She probably said, now this is serious. This brother is consistent. So I got an A uh, for the uh, work on Greece. But for me, I realized that we've got to master this whole sweep of knowledge coming out of the African world, coming out of the European world, coming out of the Asian world. And so fortunately, I was able to, my, my growth was uh, in that vein. So when I began to, t to teach, I went to Europe, I got my education uh, in terms of European uh, and African culture because people in Europe, like Dr. Sheikh Antetiep, is when I met him, one of the greatest minds in the world, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Yep. And so when I graduated from undergraduate and got my BA, I beat out 160 white boys for a Rotary International Fellowship. And so that allowed me to go to Europe and, and, and Switzerland. And so that's when I had a chance to see this larger world. And so uh, I was able to continue to grow. And I wrote an article about a closer look at the world, that the American University is teaching you to be a cog in the wheel, teaching you to be uh, seeking after having a comfortable job uh, as part of this American system. When there were forces moving through the world, economic, political, cultural forces, uh, forces around uh, nationalism, forces around Africanism, pan-Africanism, nation building, forces around communism, forces around technology, so in Europe, I was able to see it and feel it. What do you mean, Dr. J, you ever see it? I'm sitting in an amphitheater with 200 students. I'm the only black person there. And what are they being taught? Europe has been devastated by World War II. Mm -hmm. For Europe to get off its butt, it had to rebuild. You rebuild, starting first and foremost with the economy. So I'm sitting with the people who rebuilt Europe. Uh, Professor Ruban, Professor Olaf, these were the people who were helping to pull the vast European nations together that had been devastated by World War II. And in order to build for China's a uh, 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 culture that's going to last, they established a coal and steel uh, community, linking a new economy. And of course, when the professors were being critical about America, and they, uh, America had a 100-day steel strike. And Professor Ellis, it was almost as if he was looking up at me and saying, uh, you know, no nation should be able to afford a 100-day steel strike. That's a waste of the economy. And so the people turned around and looked at me. I said, no, I'm black American. I have nothing to do with steel. <laughs> but the Europeans rebuild out of the ashes of destroyed cities in every part of Europe. They built by having the coal and steel complex right. uh, put in place and help them rebuild. And so these were the things you were able to learn in Europe that you you would not get into American economy, would not get going deep into these uh, things. So uh, after that European experience, I came back and instead of going to law school, I, uh, w I, which I had been accepted, I said, no, I need to be into this economics, politics, and culture. And so I haven't looked back. I went to law school for a year, but I already was planning to go to Africa and, and other places. And I did. We've been to Africa and around the world, my wife and I and, and our partners, uh, not just one or two times, but 50 times, 60 times. I, I've been mm -hmm. to Ethiopia seven times. Met Haile Selassie and his leadership five times. We met in Kuma and and. Uh, Azikwe in Nigeria, uh, Sheikh Ture, trying to build a nation in Guinea. And wherever I went, economics was the foundation. You have to have an economic foundation or that you're not in the ball game. Exactly. You know, and, and, and so that's the, we have to understand, and Kuma understood that. And he came to America to be a preacher, but when he went to Lincoln University, there were people there who were thinking economics, politics, and culture, a system of development. Mm -hmm. And so who was at Lincoln University? Azikawe, 
who became the president of Nigeria and helped to push Nigeria onto an economic process. And who had also been at, at Lincoln? Uh, and Krumah. And Krumah got his degree. He first came to be a preacher. But once he got there, he saw the larger world. Just as when I went to Europe, I saw the larger world. And then Krumah started moving into economics. And there was a friend of ours, uh, Brother Philpott, who was able to move and Kuma from Lincoln University and he uh, to be his chauffeur. And he would take Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah, the candidate leader of the New Nation building in Africa, they would take him to Howard University from Lincoln. Now that's a, a Route 1, or 95 now, and so that's not a heavy drive. But where did, what did Nkrumah do? Where did he go? He went into Howard where you had uh, uh, scholars looking at history and economics and whatnot. And the person who was the leader in the group was Leo Hansberry. Mm -hmm. So this is a brother who had a world, he traveled around the world. And so he built around him other scholars. And who was with Leo Hansberry at Howard? Ralph Bunch. And what was his role? He had the role of being with his black brothers, but then when the international world hit the point where they needed to have a not the old League of Nations, they needed a United Nations. And so Ralph Bunch left his work at Howard and went to help set up the United Nations. And so that uh, process in, in the 46 or whatever was complemented by African nations emerging and seeking independence. And uh, following Haile Selassie, who in 1936 or 37, when the fascists from Ethiopia, uh, invaded Ethiopia from Italy, mm -hmm. uh, Haile Selassie went to the World League of Nations and pleaded with them to help Ethiopia. Ethiopia stretched forth its hands unto these nations to get these ruffians off our back. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the uh, Italians wreaked damage. Uh, Ethiopians had thrown them out of out of Ethiopia years before the Battle of Adua, uh, when the Italians invaded at that point. But because they had to build a new world based upon some some serious uh, understandings of of helping each other and justice and whatnot. Ethiopia was able to stand after World War II. But the Africans knew that they had to come together. Individual nations were not going to do it. Uh, individual nations cannot function up against a collectivity of nations like an empire, the British Empire, or the French colonial uh, empire, or even little nations like Belgium. Mm -hmm were able to get the Congo, which was 50 times larger than this little Belgian nation, but they had control of it through agreements that the Europeans had made. And so economics is the key. Belgium, an insignificant nation, had one of the richest territories on the planet Earth. Right. No nation is going for it than the Congo. And the Europeans look at this African richness as predators. The Germans uh, uh, emperor Bismarck called them the Germans in 1870 to Berlin after he won a war with France and he his claim was I want a part of the economics of Africa. And so they carved up Africa. And, and Berlin and conference mm -hmm. responded to that by forming their own unity. So in, in 1945, uh, the Africans f formed, got together in uh, Europe, 250 or more of them, 300 of them came together from various nations of English speaking uh, Europe, and they had the, pan, the first Pan-African Congress in which they looked at things such as economics. They looked at things, uh, the politics to manage uh, economics. 
And then you have to have a cultural dimension to keep the things together. And so economics, politics, and culture is the key to the system of development. And so happy as a process and happy as an actuality uh, comes out of that uh, understanding. And it really works out well because not only do you have with people like Professor Small, who's been to Mecca, who's uh, worked close with El Malik Azabaz and Malcolm X, mm-hmm. and right. well, assisted uh, Malcolm's sister Ella after Malcolm was taken from us uh, with his uh, death. And so Professor Small has been dealing with this economic, politics, and cultural thing. Economics is the foundation of living. Every cell of your body has to have an economic dimension. Every, uh, otherwise, it, it will dysfunction. Right. So economics is the key to, to life. But if, those, if that economics is not regulated, then it will not serve you like it needs to. So politics is the complement to manage properly economics. So economics and politics are the foundation your creative, productive capability uh, economically and your political capability to manage this economics. But if it's going to serve you and your people in the current circumstance, in the future circumstances, then culture is the key. Culture, you've got to have a cultural dimension, the values, deep values, a, a values of, for example, in the African communal cooperatives, uh, I call it the three C's communal, cooperative, and collective development. Right. You have an economy, an economic process in which you you develop and produce things, but you share it. Um, there's a communal, cooperative, African model of, of uh, development, and I'm looking at uh, my uh, Albany speech, which they call, which we, <laughs> organization named us, like, and we're talking about the three C's, the African culture centered around three C's, communal, cooperative, and collective spirituality. And the European, unfortunately, coming from a more deprived environment, the European model is the three D's, domination, destruction, and death, profit by any means necessary. The African spirituality model is a, a much more advanced model than a model that produces uh, people fighting each other and producing a Hitler. Right. And it's, you're burning people in gas chambers and ovens, not just Jews, but any uh, people that you oppose. Unfortunately, Hitler got stopped in uh, North Africa. Uh, otherwise, he would have been burning up a uh, hundred million Africans if he could. Mm-hmm. That's the sickness. The German culture might have produced uh, some bright people in their culture, but generally it's a culture of the predator. Domination, destruction, and death. So let me... And, uh, and right, go ahead. Other, go ahead and finish that thought. You know, uh, the other European nations may not be uh, as much as of a predator as the Germans, but they had a culture in which certain strong individuals, the lords of the manor, they dominated, and most of the people were their serfs, mm-hmm. landless serfs. And so they had to submit to this uh, European model of the three Ds, domination, destruction, and death, and profit for the lords by any means necessary. In fact, the European system was so vicious that it dominated sexual right. uh, development. And people say, Dr. what are you talking about? I say, well, <laughs> the way feudalism worked, the lord of the manor controlled everything. And if there was a little maiden in the southern part of his manor, and then she liked this uh, young man in the northern part of his manor, and they decided with their families to get uh, married, the lord of the manor had the right of first night. In other words, he had a right to go to, to bed with the maiden before the, 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 the 
husband to be. Yes. I said, these are the part of the, this is the European culture that we need to understand because they bring that into the modern culture. Mm-hmm. Domination, destruction, the enemies necessary is the corporate model. And so the corporations in America come out of the slave system model, which was what? Domination, destruction, and death. And it will still be going on in the most vicious way if we had not got together communally, corporately, and collectively to block it and to stop it and force it into another mode. And so that's what happy does. It allows you to see the movement of these forces through time in the different periods. But it's important for us to understand that when the Europeans were trying to put their world together after World War II and met at the UN, uh, set up the United Nations, which was a much better process than the League of Nations, they were not thinking of peoples of color or peoples uh, of Asian, African, and uh, uh, even Arab background. They were thinking of European nations uh, coming together. So Africans had the courage, and, and some of the uh, Arab had the wisdom to come together and plan their own future. Right. So in North Africa, there was the Algerian War, and there was the Tunisians demanding freedom and whatnot. And so in 1952, Gamal Nasser and Naguib, Egyptian military men who had a heavy dosage of Africanists, they produced a coup, uh, a military coup that threw out the Turks and other descendants of European domination. And for the first time in 2000 years, black people were ruling in Egypt. And uh, that uh, inspiration that they got to put uh, power behind their desires in 52 and 53, it inspired uh, people in the other parts of the Middle East uh, to uh, seek freedom. And eventually you had uh, in Asia, 54, you had then began full in, in uh, the Asian country that became Vietnam. In 1955, you had the African and Asian nations that had a major freedom meeting at the Bang Dung Conference. And even our people in America said, we need to be a part of that. Adam Clayton Powell was at the Bang Dung Conference in 1954 representing us. 1955, 56, the Sudan is independent. 1957, Ghana's independent. 1958, Guinea's independent. 1959, Cuba's independent. In, in 60, 12 African nations under the British colonial system, including Nigeria, become independent. And then 61, 2, and 3. So this process of Africans seeking a design that serves their people is real. And in, and the, one of the base uh, structures that they put in place was to come together and plan a mutual strategy. So the Pan-African Conference in 1945, which lasted several months in uh, England, and uh, who was there uh, to lead it symbolically? Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. Who was there to help manage it? Uh, Kwame Nkrumah. Who was there to assist in the planning? George Padmore of the Caribbean. And George Padmore wrote a, was a leading uh, black person in terms of the communist world movement, the common turn. But he saw that this new movement of European economic and, and cultural development was not sharing uh, the wealth and other things that they theoretically talked about, it had been manipulated to be white Russian nationalism. Right. And so uh, George Patmore, this great brother from the Caribbean, he uh, stepped away from communism and wrote a fabulous book called Pan-Africanism or Communism. And no one knew better that the plans the way communism was being carried out were not going to benefit black folks and they needed Pan-Africanism. So he joined uh, Nkrumah in the new nation of Ghana. And then you had a brother, again, coming from South America, 
from Diana Ross O'Connor. And he wrote a brilliant book on Pan-Africanism within. That if, or you, if you can learn to work together, you're going to have to develop some socialization and acculturation in which you get rid of the negative that you're black and ugly or you're black and helpless or you're black and you need to be enslaved. So we need to look at this enormous history of African peoples trying to restore themselves to a position of greatness in the world. And the happy movement gives us a chance to tap into so many of our scholars who have been doing outstanding work and they can fit in our sister Julia Malvo. She's an yes. economist, expert in economy. Mm-hmm. She has a chance to make her. And, and, and I've had her on the show. Mm-hmm. I've had her on the show before. Yes. Right. Okay. And when it comes to the psychology of the mind mm-hmm. and psychiatry of the inner mind, you have people like Francis Cress Welsing, a uh, wonderful spirit among us, and her associate, uh, uh, Pat Newton. And Pat, mm-hmm. like Professor Smalls, like, and others, Marcus Garvey Jr., etc., we were initiated as African. Uh, uh, leaders. In other words, they had uh, an installment process, and we were installed as as, uh, as sub chiefs and and uh, female uh, queen mothers. And so we have to see, as you look through this history, uh, this connectedness, and that's what Happy allows uh, us to do. And Happy represents the Nile Valley. And years ago, when I was uh, fighting to, you know, uh, to make African studies and black studies something. I had two articles, and they uh, were published in a new magazine set up by uh, our brothers from Africa. And uh, it was called African Commentaries. And uh, so I, dealing with our sacred mission, I wrote one article, Africa, Birthplace of Humanity. African origins, origins of early humanity. The oldest fossil finds of early man uh, was made in Africa in 1960 by archaeologist uh, S. Uh, L. S. Leakey. Uh, he named his finds Zanzanthropus, uh, meaning Eastern man. It was found in the Ogobai Gorge in northern Tanzania, which is an archaeological archaeologist paradise. Many ancient fossils and stone tools have been found there over the years. There are five distinct layers of strata of earth visible in the cliff. The oldest was formed more than two million years ago. One day while climbing up the slopes, this is Leakey discovered two teeth embedded in the rock side of the cliff. After 19 days of digging, the Leakey's uncovered an almost complete skull and and stone tools. Radiocarbon-14 test method of determining the age of the fossils find, uh, finds allows the scientists to test the object uh, that does not go back uh, more than 50,000 years. Because the Xanderpus was matched with older, older than 50,000 years, another newer method to determine the age of the fossils was needed. This method was called potassium argon and allows the scientists to test an object that goes back two million years. Scientists at the University of California testing Zanthropus Boise and, and they believe that this early man was one million seven hundred thousand years old. Over the past twenty five years various fossil finds have been have been made in, in Africa and have been scientifically dated to be millions of years old. One find recently discovered and found to be several years old was named Lucy. Right. And is the object of a best selling book. Uh, these, these discoveries and others have found the established Africa as the cradle of humanity. What? That Lucy find, going back mm-hmm. over three million years, the uh, Africans named her Dankanesh. Right. And the uh, beautiful thing is that she made a world tour. Because of her importance, she visited museums all over the world. And when they built a new center in Addis Ababa, with some of the Chinese money, they built a new center for the 50-plus African nations. 
that were part of the African Union, they brought Dankinesh back from her world tour, and she was given a place of prominence in the entrance. No one could go into the new complex without turning left after the security check, and they greeted Dankinesh, or Dankinesh greeted them in the sacred place that she uh, created for herself by being discovered. Now, most of us in these institutes, we ain't know nothing about this stuff. This stuff is going on, and we need to make it a part of art, and that's what Happy is doing, making it part of our contemporary education. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Hold on just a second, Doctor J. Hold on just a second. We're coming up on a mandatory commercial break, so just hold it right there. Uh, just a couple things. <laughs> okay. Well, give us the name of that first article that you referenced. Give us the name of that first article. Article that I wrote uh, in uh, 1989 mm -hmm. is uh, Africa, birthplace of humanity, African oh. origins of early humanity. So okay. Okay, and, and that's online. We can pull it up because I'll pull it up and show it to the listening audience uh, during commercial break. That's online. I can pull that up. I'm not sure if it is, and we'll try to get it to you. Okay. All right. The second article. Uh huh. Is, Go ahead. Another issue of reclaiming Nile Valley civilization. Reclaiming Nile Valley civilization. Reclaiming Nile Valley civilization. And uh, in a uh, heavy print is the greatest civilization of the ancient world. And, and so that's, and that's it's our sacred mission to bring forth this knowledge. Right. Okay. And, uh, okay. This is what we're going to do. We're going to bring forth the knowledge on the other side of the break because we, we, we're coming up against the break, Dr. J. You got, a, you got about 20 more minutes to spend with us. I know you, I know you just got back home. Okay. You, you got you, your word back. Okay. Okay. All right. Just. Okay, just just hold it right there, and then we're coming up on a break. When we come back, we'll pick it up with uh, reclaiming Nile Valley civilization and sharing this information with the world. Stand by, Dr. J. Okay, everybody, you listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. Also, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, PayPal.me forward slash the ehn show we're here six days a week and uh this helps us keep doing the research stay on the air keep broadcasting etc we'll be back in a few minutes all right stand by everybody stand by okay so dink nash is um it was dr yosef ben yakin and the name of dink nash uh dr uh johansson who led that expedition that discovered the remains uh, of Australopithecus afarensis, which was the species uh, that Dinknesh is. Uh, the remains are 3.2 million years old. And the archaeological team, they were listening to the song by the Beatles, Lucy in the Diamond, Lucy in the in the, Lucy uh, in the sky with diamonds or something like that. And they called her Lucy. OK, but Dr. Ben, Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen said if she's an African woman. She must have an African name. And uh, he named her Dink Nesh. Dink Nesh means you are amazing. You are amazing. OK, stand by. We'll, we'll be back from break in uh, four minutes or so. We'll be back with Dr. Leonard Jeffries. We're talking about the film Hapi, the role of economics in the development of civilization. And we're talking about uh a lot of other things also stand by um you can visit hapifilm.com hapifilm.com okay let's see let's go to my website uh so we have this information at our website africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com uh for the screening here in detroit sunday september 26th just go to our website is there we have the link uh to hapifilm.com also so you can purchase tickets i'll be moderating the panel discussion sunday september 26 um 3 p.m at the charles h wright museum of african-american history here in detroit 
stand by. Now you can also at our website, you can register for the, um, you can register for the, uh, new 10 week online course that I teach on Saturdays It's normally on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 PM Eastern standard time. We just had class number two today. As soon as you register, you can watch class number one and two. Uh, we do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. Click on register here. It takes you to the next page. Click on enroll and um, you can watch the class and we have bonus content. Also, we do the class live. All the sessions are recorded and we go through and look at history. Uh, we look at history leading up to the Civil War starting in 1861. And then we look at what caused the civil war that we look at what caused civil war to happen and we go through a look at history basically from 1865 through 1968. 9 10 a.m superstation a division of adele media i'm brother michael i'm hotel and after history network show we do with current events in history and politics education economic empowerment entrepreneurship relationships love sex health issues and much much more unfortunately many people confuse what racism is racism is a power structure and if laws and policies that put us in this predicament it's going to be laws and policies that take us out so when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do a teach what it doesn't know we have it all on 9 10 a.m superstation the views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM the Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We are in our number two um, of today's show. We're going to go back to Dr. Jeffries in just a minute here. Be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the homepage of the website. We have the information for the screening taking place of the film Hapi that's taking place on Sunday, September 26, 2021, at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. It's going to be uh, at 3 p.m. Um, I'll be moderating the panel discussion and uh, we have the link to hapifilm.com here so you can purchase tickets also. Um, we're going to do a screening of the film and have a panel discussion. It's going to be fantastic. So come on out. And also uh, at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, you can also register for my new 10 week online course that I teach on Saturdays, 12 noon, the 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And we go through, we look at some events that led up to the Civil War starting in 1861. And then we go through and we look at, uh, especially from 1865 through 1968, uh, we look at uh, last year, the Civil War, 13th Amendment, uh, Reconstruction, 1865, 1877, Jim Crow era, World War I, World War II, Great Migration, 1915 and 1970, World War I, World War II, Civil Rights Movement and Black Power Movement to understand what laws and policies were put in place to put us in a predicament we're in today so we understand where we go from here. We do the classes live, all the sessions are recorded. Uh, as soon as you register, you can watch uh, class number one, you can watch the class we just did today. And um, you can still have access to the class even after the 10 week online course is over with. So the course is normally $130, it's on sale, $70. Click on register here, it takes you to the next page and then just click on enroll. As soon as you enroll, you can start watching uh, the course. And there's uh, six bonus uh, lectures that you get from me included in that course as well. OK, let's go back to uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. OK, so Dr. J, before the break, you were talking about two articles that you've written, African Birthplace of Humanity and Reclaiming Nile Valley Civilization. And we're also talking about the film uh, Ha P. Uh, the role of economics in the development of civilization. So tell us about that. Tell us about that second article, Reclaiming Nile Valley Civilization. Well, fortunately, uh, we have had this enormous um, explosion of information mm -hmm. uh, about, about the Nile. And so we've been able to organize organizations around it. And so uh, you have a, a brotherhood of African scholars like Dr. Naeem Akbar mm -hmm. and Dr. Wade Nobles and their associates. Uh, they've actually 
reformed, reformed the organizations that they inherited, which are centered around white folks is looking at the world. And they brought the African perspective. So Dr. Wade, for example, um, has produced a book on the Haitian Revolution. Yes. And uh, the unfinished revolution in, in Haiti. Mm-hmm. Dr. Clark has done the same thing. He has his great work is Africans at the Crossroads. And uh, the unfinished revolution of Nkrumah and Garvey and Malcolm and, and whatnot. So our people need to start to buy some of these books and these, uh, and then get into a library and get some articles that might be helpful. For example, we had a conference, the first Pan-African Conference on Reparations in Abuja, Nigeria, April 27, 29, 1993. And it was organized by one of my associates, Ambassador Dudley Thompson, who was from uh, Jamaica, and during the period of World War II, he got into the uh, Royal Air Force flying jets. And uh, when the conference, the war was over, he was at the first, uh, at the Pan African Conference that Padmore and Cuomo and Du Bois and everybody was at. But then he continued, they continued this tradition of these conferences. And he headed in 1993 the first Pan African Conference on Reparations which was at the new city, the new capital of Nigeria, Abuja. And who was there? So many of us were there. Uh, I couldn't make it because my lawyer said, we got to go to trial. Neither could my partner, Professor Scobie. However, the Albany speech was there, the full Albany speech. And Scobie's speech on reparations uh, was there. And so I'm saying there's so much uh, that we can put together to help our people begin to understand that this, if people, everybody needs to have in their library, Newsweek, November 10th, 1986, in the middle of the struggle over the Nile Valley and the European role, here comes Newsweek with an article that's entitled The Way We Were. And on the cover is a, a caveman. <laughs> with a bone necklace right. and, and a fur in around him. And it says, Our Ice Age heritage, language, art, fashion, and the family. As fashion, a skin, an animal skin around, an arch, uh, uh, you know, some a bone necklace, and then they have inside, uh, which is a fantastic. The people of the late Ice Age invented language, art, and music, and laid the foundations of trade, religion, class distinctions, even fashion. And then they have a picture of a complex of bones. And it says, a condo on the Russian plains, archaeological uh, uh, digging in Ukraine uncovered huts, Built of intricately stacked mammoth bones as shown in this museum reconstruction. Now, how the hell can you stack some mammoth bones as a shelter from the snow and you're going to compare that with the pyramids, the pyramids of Giza? Right. The grand pyramids that 102 million blocks carved out of the granite rock and put in place, how the hell can you even think of comparing a, a, a bone motel with the Great Pyramid? But that's the problem that we have. The European refuses to give up this lie about uh, his superiority. And and here you have creative explosion. The exhibit uh, Dark Caves and Bright Vision at the American Museum of Natural History in New York displays 300 works of art and artifacts from the late Ice Age and through Picasso-like figurines and minimalist cave murals, the collection tells the story of how our ancestors lived and thought. Some highlights of the show which run through mid-January. Now, they say our ancestors. Our ancestors were not the cave people killing each other and whatnot. Right. They lived along the riverbanks, and it's on those riverbanks 
which which will allow them to produce the fertility to have culture and civilization. And so in the article I have reclaiming Nile Valley civilization, I say very clearly, the Nile Valley played a unique role in human history because it's because of its special ecology, featuring the annual overthrow of rich soil from the Great Lakes regions of Central Africa. The banks of the Nile were able to support intensive agricultural development, food services, and concentrations of population migrating from different parts of Africa and Asia laid the foundations of Nile Valley civilization. This special combination of African peoples, the sun, the fertile land, and the rivers coming together were blended together to produce the greatest civilization in this ancient world. Enormous impact, the enormous impact of these high cultures in the Nile Valley, which spread to various other parts of Africa, uh, were a part of, of this history. These discoveries have established Africa as the site of the earliest domestication of grains and cattle several thousand years before similar domestication took place in Western Asia around Mesopotamia. African sites were, test, were tested with carbon-14 uh, methods and discovered to be about 15,000 or 18,000 years, whereas the Asian sites have traditionally been dated to be about 7,000 or 8,000 years. The University of Chicago research team in the 1960s discovered 33 royal tombs in Nubia, south of Egypt, along the Nile Valley. Many thousands of objects in these tombs have been dated to be more than 5,300 years old, making this discovery the earliest evidence of an established monarchy in the history of the world. This new evidence, along with the older finds, uh, the uh, existing monuments, temples, and tombs and pyramids have firmly established Egypt, Nubia, Ethiopia, and the Nile Valley as the cradle of civilization. These developments of African peoples of the Nile became the foundation uh, for the cultural progress of various groups in Africa, provide the basis for the cultural unity of Africa through its, addition, through its traditions and institutions. These developments can be seen through the evidence of the communal cooperative and collective value system throughout the continent. African social structures have functioned through the extended family system with a unique preservation of the spirit of the ancestors. It is this African value system that became the basis for Nile Valley civilization, explaining the monumental building of temples, tombs, and pyramids, the need to produce sacred writing and literature and medicine, mathematics and art and architecture. All of these developments left a golden legacy for the ancient world, which not only nurtured Africa, but inspired early Hebrews, Greeks, who sojourned in the Nile Valley. Niger River system, the river systems flow more than 2,000 miles to West Africa from the highlands of the Republic of Guinea to Mali and Niger. Uh, ocean along the Atlantic and spills into the Atlantic Ocean. The river actually splits the Republic of Nigeria, one of America's most important nations, Africa's most important nations in the half. And it's a source of, of its names during the medieval period. 1000 AD 600 Nile Valley, Niger Valley was the center of African Islamic civilization that produced great empires, Ghana, Mali, and Sangai, uh, that were famous for their gold trade across the Sahara into the Mediterranean world. This Sudanic civilization, which is mixes of traditional African cultural systems and Islam, was based on an agricultural development combined with extensive commercial activity in several of the city-states, like Kombe, Kombe, Gao, Malpi, uh, uh, and Timbuktu, uh, which was famous for its trading in its university at Sankare. In fact, the emperor of Mali is famous for having a gold pilgrimage to Mecca, in which the gold market in the Mediterranean was messed up for almost 60 or 70 or 100 years because he had so much gold that he gave away for the love of Allah that it upset the economics of the Mediterranean world. This is right, Massa Musa. Here. Yeah, Emperor Massa Musa. Yes. yes. Yeah, Massa Musa. And uh, he went to Mecca, did his pilgrimage, and then brought back scholars and architects and others to help expand his growth. 
uh, the growth of his uh, powerful empire. So we should not run away from Africa. We need to run to it. And so happy is a chance for you to run to Africa. So you don't have to submit to this intellectual terrorism and this spiritual uh, assault on your psyche by thinking Africans contributed nothing. You can't say they didn't contribute. They contributed civilization itself. They contributed humanity in its highest early form. And so if you want to get serious, then you've got to get my buddy uh, Sheikh Antipia. And I have in my hands his great work, Civilization or Barbarism, an authentic uh, anthropology, Sheikh, C-H-E-I-K-H. Middle name Anta, A N T A. Last name Jup, D I O P. And this is one of the greatest scholars in the history of the world. But his work was great, but it had to be shared by others who helped him grow and develop. That's why this training of Africans becomes so important. It's not the individual or the European teachers' education, it's the collectivity, sitting together, studying together. And I luckily got $20,000 to help get this translate. I took a sabbatical leave and went to Europe. Dr. Clark gave me my orders. He said, we can't wait 20 years for this great work to be produced. You need to take off and go and translate it. But I couldn't do that in, uh, in the 80s because too much was going on in terms of black studies around the, around the world. Right, right. So after 82, I did take up the charge that Dr. Clark gave me, and I went to Europe uh, to take on this task of translating this book. But this book, for the first 100 pages, is for the mega scientists, anthropologists, etc. I had to have all kinds of dictionaries to translate the first 100 pages. And luckily, I opened my mouth, uh, as I do on things that concern me, at the World Council of Churches, and I said I didn't think the churches were doing enough to help the struggle of black people in South Africa. Mm-hmm. So the head of the World Council of Churches was Dr. Philip Potter, who was a childhood friend of my deputy chair at Black Studies, Professor Edward Scobie, uh, who had been an RAF pilot bombing Germans and knocking their planes out of the sky. Scobie uh, and Potter grew up together, and Potter felt close enough to me to say, look, Drop everything else you're doing, and you're going to be in charge of the activities relating to the struggle in South Africa. So I finished the book. I edited the book. The major articles was 60 or 70 pages that I wrote on uh, the crisis in Southern Africa, where you could bring to life a Steve Biko and these other great South African spirits that were moving and, and shaking the world. And Steve Biko is a symbol of the movement of the youth. He was the Malcolm X of his time, and one of his great works uh, needs to be uh, dealt with uh, is his story. And the fantastic thing, he left us with, like Malcolm left us with so many important words, but what uh, Biko said, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mm-hmm. mind of the oppressed. Let me repeat it. Exactly. The most potent weapon hands of the pressure is the mind of the oppressed. And white folks, true to their brutishness, bashed his mind out of his brain cage and killing him. Mm-hmm. But it unleashed a revolution of spiritual power among the youth of South Africa who revolted, who faced the guns, and who helped bring about the change. Nelson Mandela, as great as he was, he was in jail. You can't live with so much into it. These children were on the streets inspired uh, to produce a revolution in South Africa, and their movement helped to change things forever. Absolutely. Now, that's why I'm, we, we got to study these things in a serious way. Check out the depth is a school of knowledge. And here's another book of his, The African Origins of Civilization, Materials, translated by Mercer Cook, Professor Mercer Cook. Mm-hmm. He was a professor at Howard University. He had created uh, uh, a relationship with uh, Shikanta to produce his, uh, his works in, in English. And then this one, uh, Dr. Clark had asked me to make sure that his 
premier work. Um, and so here's the relationship he had with his mentor, Ali Diop. And Ali Diop had a partnership with his beautiful wife, Madame Diop. And they produced a think tank. They produced a place where blacks could meet and strategize. And so the strategy was to get a PhD for Sheikh Andrew Diop. And it finally worked. I was there in 1959 when Diop was fighting for his, to get a dissertation for the third time he had to defend his thesis. Allian organized 150 of the best scholars, white scholars mainly, to be there when he was defending so he would have the support. Right. And I was there uh, in the streets with a whole lot of students. I didn't have enough clout to be going inside, but you, you were next to the Sorbonne, the Pillar Temple, where the graduate education, university education takes place in Paris. And then when you walk hey, down the street, you Hey, Dr. J, Dr. J, we got to hold it right there. We're coming up on a mandatory commercial break. When we come back from the break, we'll hold you over for a few more minutes. When we come back from the break, finish up the story about Dr. Diop defending his dissertation. And then also you called me a couple months ago and we talked about Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday. I want to talk about that for a few minutes because you and I talked about how it could become a powerful weapon if we use it correctly, as opposed to just using it as a day to get drunk. So just stand by. We'll come back and we'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by. All right. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation of Future Radio. I'm speaking with Dr. Leonard Jeffries. We're talking about the film P, the role of economics and the development of civilization. The screening that's taking place here in Detroit, Sunday, September 26, 3 p.m. at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by. Stand by. Back from back from break in three minutes. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. How's everybody doing? We've got. Uh, if Cassius Clay only knew Muhammad Ali was a vicious slave trader. Um, Kenneth, uh, well, it was Elijah Muhammad that gave him that name, Muhammad Ali. Uh, Kenneth, I'll be glad when we're on the other side of this pandemic. Okay, so Dr. J can travel. All right, everybody stand by back from breaking two minutes. If you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Okay. And we'll post a link here. It's also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Who still needs to register for the uh, new 10 week online course that I teach on Saturdays from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement, um, 1865 to 1968? From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement, 1865 to 1968. It's right on the homepage of our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can. Uh, Register right there for the course. It's on sale seventy dollars, regularly one hundred thirty dollars. We do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. The class is normally on on Saturdays, twelve noon to two p.m. 
Stand by. Second after History Network show, we deal with current events of history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do a piece what it doesn't know. We have it all on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. 910, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on 910 AM Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, September 19th, 2021, and we are live. Uh, we'll be. We'll, we're speaking with Dr. Linda Jeffries. We're going to bring them back on in just a minute here. Be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the new 10-week online course that I teach on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We look at a little more than a 100-year period of time. Uh, starting with the last year of the Civil War in 1865, but we'll also look at some events leading up to the Civil War starting April 12, 18, 1861. And we go through uh, Reconstruction Era, 1865 to 1877, Jim Crow Era, World War I, World War II, Great Migration, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. All right, to understand the laws and policies that were put in place after uh the civil civil war ends after reconstruction ends uh to understand the laws and policies that put us in the predicament that we're in today to understand where we go from here so visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com as soon as you register you can watch the class uh we did this weekend and you'll be ready for uh next weekend's class okay uh i want to go back to dr leonard jeffries okay so dr j right before the break you were talking about dr shankata diop having to defend his dissertation Okay, go ahead and finish uh, that history lesson, please. Yes, yeah. um, certainly. This this brother is is a, a school of knowledge, um, who by himself challenged the European claim of superiority, but he didn't do it by himself. He was one who uh, worked uh, with others. For one thing, his youthful development comes out of the Maurit uh, community in Senegal. That's an Africanized Muslim culture, civilization. Uh, in fact, their belief is that uh, while Mecca becomes the center of the Islamic world, that Tuba was their holy city, and they could make uh, a real pilgrimage to Tuba. So Sheikh Atijep has an indigenous African Muslim foundation that gave him strength to prevail. Uh, and he needed that strength because if any of the modern political leaders destroyed him or captured him and imprisoned him uh, and uh, led to his death, that would tear the heart out of Senegal because the Maurits had a serious system of economics, politics, and culture. They handled trade and the basis for the economics. They had a political structure based around their Islamic understanding. And and they were prepared uh, to uh, a move with the various political waves that approached them. Uh, so he had that indigenous strength. And then he was well trained in the this, in this Senegal because Senegal needed Africans to save them in World War One. Uh, they put, produced the Senegalese Trailleur, the fight, African fighters that helped to save France and eventually helped to free uh, uh, Africans from colonial, colonialism. So this uh, tradition of the Maurits, the best tradition that the French did their own, and then he was able finally to go to Paris after World War II, and he was able to uh, get the new awakening in France, uh, because after fascism had devastated uh, a good part of Europe, then socialism and communism emerged. And so he had a chance to, uh, to just put his toes in that. 
So all of these formations of, of uh, intellectual development became a part of this a brother who threw them all together in terms of Pan-Africanism. And the person that was key to the Pan-Africanism was his mentor. And he dedicated this uh, magnificent work, which is the victory for African peoples in dealing with the history. He dedicated it to Alion Diop. And when you say Alion, you've got to say Madame Diop, his great wife. They were a team that put together an African think tank that influenced the world's development. And he said in this book, Civilization of Barbarism, as he dedicated, I dedicate this book to the memory of Ali Ndiyo, who died on the battlefield of culture. Now, that's very important. And he could have said the battlefield of economics. He could have said the battlefield of politics. But no, he highlighted the battlefield of culture. The great struggle in the world is the struggle for the mind. And so we have to struggle to fortify the African mind so we can win that mind that's coming from other parts of the world, including the Arab world, the Asian world, and the European world. And so African people have to fight for their, their future on the planet. Ali Young, you knew what you came to do on this earth, a life entirely dedicated to others, nothing for yourself, everything for others, a heart filled with goodness and generosity, a soul steep in nobility, a spirit always serene, simplicity personified, explanation point. Did the demurge, did the movement of the, of the world. I uh, want to provide us with an example of an ideal perfection by calling you into existence. Alas, the territorial community to which you knew how to convey better than anyone else the measure of human truthfulness that sprang from the innermost depths of your being was deprived of you too soon. But the remembrance of you will never be erased from the memory of African peoples to whom you dedicated your life. That is why I am dedicating this work to your memory in witness of a brotherly friendship that is stronger than time. Check out the Diep Dakar Senegal. That's the African spiritual bonding that has kept us alive on the planet. And we got to appreciate that. Yes. These two men doing the work of the Creator and providing us with the ammunition to let the African truth rise. Now, Madame Diep, Alion Diep's wife, she was an African. Powerful. Queen Mother type African who stood with her husband and developed this institution, which is still producing work in Paris next to the Sudan. And their office was uh, between the Collège de France, where you got your undergraduate degree, and the Sudan, where you got your graduate degree. They put this institution strategically in the middle of cultural and intellectual development in France. And they maintained their contact, however, with Africans everywhere, especially those in French-speaking uh, Caribbean, Martinique, and Guadeloupe, and Guyane, also in Canada, where you have the uh, French-speaking uh, folks. And certainly, they were able to link with African scholars such as myself and others who were a part of this process. So, this is the, the power for us to move our agenda is there if we continue to come together like our brothers are doing in Detroit, like they're doing in Atlanta. I just had a, a, a fantastic conversation yesterday with Atlanta in the evening and in the day with Nigeria. And uh, so we are not without the means. We are not without the programming. We just have to take time and lay out our agenda and make it happen. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, so I'm glad that uh, in Detroit, we should deal, uh, Detroit is a, a special part of the black community. I've been there many times. So I consider it one of my second homes. Yes. And so, and the museum, as I actually uh, got contact with the museum, when I first was doing a study of urban crisis in America in 1959, and then I was going to 
of Detroit at uh, different periods. When I was in Detroit early, the, the doctor had a, a mobile unit at the museum outside of his house. Yeah, Dr. Charles H. Wright, yes. the founder of the museum, for those that outside of Detroit that don't know. Yes, Charles H. Wright. Yeah, go ahead. And that seed of uh, his ingenuity with his family, I'm sure his partner, his wife, they were able to use that seed to eventually work with the Detroit community to produce one of the best museums uh, and, and library centers in the United States. And so we need to sustain it and maintain it. Other white folks will try to grab it back and pull it over to the white side of the equation. Mm -hmm. We need to say, no, no, you owe us. Reparations is real. And so part of our reparations uh, for enslavement and other exploitative processes of black folks, uh, we demand to have education and culture as a priority for the growth of our people. Absolutely. I have in my hands, mm -hmm. Go ahead. And I want to get to Juneteenth in just a second. Go ahead. Right. I have in my hands a um, paper presented at the first Pan African Conference on Reparations, and it was held in Abuja, Nigeria, April 27, 29, 1963. And all of these great scholars came to this. The person came to come together. The person who was a part of this in a very important way was. Uh, my adopted godfather, uh, Ambassador His Excellency Dudley Thompson, uh, who was born on, uh, we were born on the same day, January 19th, uh, 20 years apart. But he uh, was a leader of the eminent group of persons that was formed by the African Union. And, and they had this first Pan African Conference, and he outlines what it's all about. All of these great scholars participated. And you have a contingent from the United States. My father, Dr. Ronald Walters, was there. He presented uh, a, an important piece. Uh, and other scholars were there. And you see uh, so many of them. Uh, various attempts have been made to convey some understanding to the outside world of what is this thing called the African crisis or the African condition. The crisis is we have only just come to grips with it uh, is a condition. Uh, when you realize that deep down the African crisis is not new, uh, this dismal statistic, the dismal statistics are there, and the grim events can be gradually presented Uganda, Angola, Mozambique, Liberia, Zaire, Somalia. The phenomena uh, of the collapse and the near collapse and the disappearance of, of the state. In, in various parts of Africa, the loss of legitimacy and the breakdown of the new law, similar to, but not the same, as the breaking up of an imperial system like the Habsburg or the Soviet Union with ruling parts. Instability of many states in Africa to provide basic items such as food and shelter for sizable portions of its population uh, and with the complexity and the duration that uh, come, creates refugee problems, the rate of illiteracy, and urban degradation, violence, and that's just age. And that is why we have to come together uh, to, to build for the future. And we have to lay the reparations bill on the table. Right. So, uh, fortunately, uh, my um, lawyer said that uh, myself and Scobie really sh shouldn't go to the conference because we have a trial. Uh, coming up there, I was suing the university. But what they did was, that in Thompson did was, he took the Albany speech, our sacred mission, and made it a part of the, of the proceedings of the conference. And he took Stobie's uh, uh, article on reparations and made it a part. So reparations should be a part of the renaissance of African peoples. And we are truly in a period of renaissance, rebirth, the potential of doing African great things is there. And we have to see it, understand it, and make it work. Okay, uh, in the name, uh, well, go ahead, go ahead, finish that last statement. I'm saying we need, the potential is there. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that it, but people like the Chinese see the need for Africa to help build the Chinese world. People like other communists feel they need Africa's wealth to help the, 
the Congress will, like the Soviet Union, will help. But the agenda is to help the Soviet Union, not to really help Africans. So we have to have a plan that puts Africa first. That's what Garvey was all about. Africa right. First. Right. Okay, so uh, I want to uh, bring up this conversation you and I had a couple months ago dealing with um, uh, Juneteenth and Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday. Uh, I sent you an interview that um, DET IPTV did here in Detroit with me dealing with uh, Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday in the history of Juneteenth. And you called me and you and I talked and we both said that uh if we use the federal holiday properly this will uh advance issues dealing with the george floyd justice and policing act voting rights uh reparations uh all of this is connected it's connected to juneteenth and we have to correct the history we have to protect the history of juneteenth but also correct the history uh as well and actually what happened june 19th 1865 and afterwards uh, during the Reconstruction era. But um, when we look at Juneteenth, it's sponsored by Representative Sheila Jackson Lee of uh, Texas, Congressional Black Caucus, but she's also the sponsor of H.R. 40 as well, the revised H.R. 40. She picked up the fight after the Honorable John Conyers uh, retired from the House of Representatives because uh, white Democrats pushed them out, okay, and they didn't want to follow the proper process and uh, uh, do the investigation, all that stuff. They wanted to push him out, but that's a whole nother conversation. But talk about how, because one of the things I said is, is that Juneteenth forces America to have a history conversation about a history that Republican state legislatures are passing laws to suppress the teaching of that history in schools. Talk about how do we use Juneteenth as a federal holiday to help teach the proper history, and push our agenda. Well, I'm glad you raised that. Uh, because I, when you and I were beginning to get our time schedules for tonight, I was in the living room, and my wife has constantly been saying that every once in a while we see Hakeem Jeffries in a flash of a news article. Mm -hmm. But then we found out that on YouTube, you put Hakeem Jeffries' name in, and here comes all of these things that he's done with Sheila Jackson Lee and with the others in the Congress, because he's one of the leaders of the Democratic Party. But he's a conscious brother. His analysis, I said, wow. And I'm saying, well, well you know, he, he learned from you and his father and others. But no, he's, he's a lawyer. So he, and he graduated at the top of NYU Law School. And so he's putting that law analysis to it. So what you're talking about in reference to Jane, John Keith is something that him and uh, uh, Sheila she, Jackson Lee and others should get together and uh, uh, make happen because this system owes us. And if we don't get a dime, that bill uh, that uh, has to be put on the table. And it's not just Tulsa. Tulsa was an example of, of the most depraved uh, process of destroying the wealth of people. They actually put in a government plan for highways to take out the black community. That's a formula they used in other cities. Atlanta had that. Newark, New Jersey, the city where I grew up, had it. In other words, using the government to wipe out black communities so they couldn't be sustained. I did a study on American crisis for my uh, grad, uh, my college degree, mm -hmm. and I went across the country in this pattern. So. I would like to see Juneteenth used, but not singled out as the focus when we need to go through American history and show where they said they were going to do something for us, and if the bag came up uh, with uh, empty, there was nothing in the bag. The, the Detroit uh, uh, situation, and, uh, you know, as most people don't realize it, that Detroit was the automobile capital of the world, but also there was discrimination in how Ford and others handled the development of, of Detroit. And Detroit, like Cleveland and Akron and Washington, D.C., was gentrified by acts of the legislatures and the city councils. 
So I don't want us uh, blinded by the blatant Tulsa thievery and death and destruction of war against black folk. But my folks come on my father's side, come out of Georgia. And there is a whole process of white folks being jealous of black folks achieving something and having it destroyed. Um, right. And, and death, my grandfather was murdered by the Klan, not because he was not, he was a leader of the community. He, his, his household had 13 of his kids and he had seven of his relatives that him and his wife, they had farmlands and, and, and they had bigger crops than the white folks and the white folks we're jealous. The cotton train would come to the general store and stop in, in that part of Georgia. And then each of the farmers would bring their loads of cotton. And my folks would put their measly loads on the scale and they'd go away with a few dollars. Black folks would come in with their wagons uh, with all of this cotton that they had picked. And they'd go away with a big share of the monies. Jealousy by white folks over black folks having institutions and organizations, uh, it's real. And we, we need to, black men coming back from the war, having helped save France from Germany and other parts in World War I, they were a threat. Black men in arms, black men in uniform, instead of being uh, honored, helping to save uh, the Western world, uh, they were attacked, riots took place, 25 riots in, in 19... Uh, the red 1919, 1919, the Red Summer. Yes, the Red Summer. Yes, those things we need to connect. And that's certainly the death and destruction of our grandfather. I put that in the middle of it, but that didn't stop us. Eventually, our people did leave the, the South, and they went on to Ohio and, and Akron and Cleveland. They got into the industry there. And they got their houses and their communities together. And then eventually public policy was designed in such a way as to take black strength and pull it out of black hands. We just came from the burial of Sister, our queen, our sister, Alea. And she helped Brother Falls and I manage the, the great work that we were doing in Africa, the hotel, and a lot of other things that we ha have done. So we set the sister on the glory. And it was a, a nice celebration with her family and the rest of us, Professor Small and myself in particular, and my wife. Well, we started coming back up to uh, my home here above Newark, New Jersey. We went through Newark. And here you have Newark listed as one of the worst cities in America in terms of poverty and this and that and whatnot. But as we were driving up the highway, I said, this is not one of the poorest cities. It may be been managed into being the poorest city. But look, we're driving through the turnpike. Double traffic, a flow of trucks and whatnot. To our right is the seaport. It, it carries more tonnage than New York City because New York City was uh, an old, these, these are tankers. These are, the, uh, the, the enormous uh, tankers stopped floating uh, giants of commerce. This is one of the biggest seaports for tankers in, in the U.S., certainly on the East Coast. So you got the railroad right next to it. And then you got the highways. And then you got over to the left. This is the airport. This is a multi billion dollar process. And the money is being controlled by white folks and not given to North. Ross, luckily, uh, the mayor, Ras Baraka, is smart enough to have brought lawsuits and whatnot to get hundreds of, of uh, millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, that white folks were saving until the, they could turn the city around and make it more white. Luckily, Ras said, no, no, one third of that money is ours. It's hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. We want that money to help build uh, the North. Uh, uh, today, and so absolutely, we need to understand exploitation of us has gone to extremes, and they're going to do it as long as we don't raise some hell about it. 
Okay, uh, we're gonna go to the phone lines in just a minute here. Ho hold the line, John. We're, we're gonna come right to you. I know you've been holding um, the, let's see. I, I wanna just uh, share this article quickly here because you talked about uh, destruction of African-American communities. And we know that the US and the Federal Highway Acts of 1952 and 1956 drove 41,000 miles of US interstate highways through African-American communities. There's a huge, um, there's a huge expose from NBC News. We've talked about here on this show because I'm on the air six days a week for people that don't know. Uh, this article came out June 18th, 2021 bulldozed and bisected highway construction built a legacy of inequality bulldozed and bisected highway construction built a legacy of inequality and just briefly here uh an article a, a paragraph from this article says what has changed decades after the federal aid highway act of 1956 brought 41,000 miles of interstates to the country is the recognition of the harm that was done to communities left in the shade of these new aging roadways from 1957 to 1977 the program dislocated over 475,000 households and 1 million people according to the u.s department of transportation now at now as many of these hulking structures reach obsolescence the federal government and many states and cities are belatedly recognizing the harm they caused and are working with communities to design alternatives that repair the damage. But in many cases, those plans are reopening old wounds and leading to protracted debates that politicians and engineers are struggling to solve. Because with the inf with the infrastructure bill that's uh, being through uh the house and the senate one of the things that's that's it is being focused on is um uh, these uh crumbling uh expressways that are running through african-american communities and how do we try to repair that damage when they disrupted our communities um so look we're gonna we're almost out of time here i want to squeeze in this call because we've had john he's been holding the line for just a second uh so let's get john on hey john welcome to the african history network show thanks for holding john go ahead quickly with your question or comment for dr linda jeffries yeah well thank you Jose. i want to thank dr jefferson jeffries uh, jeffries right and, and in a now uh, the, dr uh, jefferson, i just want to ask you can you uh educate the people about the same thing and 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 uh France once started the Nazis and so forth, and they started the first never did. So I just wanted to ask you, could you have related to about Spain and how the the black African whole fight? John, 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 did you, John, did John, did, John, did you say Spain? S P A I N Spain, the country. Yeah. Okay. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay. What? Well, Tell them to slow down. Yeah, slow. To repeat the question slow down. Okay, okay, slow, slow down, John. What? Slow, uh, John, John, John. What? What? John, hold on. Slow, slow down. What was your question about Spain? I just want to ask them. You know, Spain. Spain started with Nazis in the, in the, in the Holocaust before Germany did. That's why. And, and, and a lot of y'all uh, Spain went to Africa and got a lot of Africans to just step to free Spain, fight for Spain and so forth. Okay. And I want to know what you're familiar, familiar with that history, Bessie. And, uh, Okay. Well, okay. So, so he's talking about Spain, uh, in uh, Spain before the Nazis. And I guess involved. Now, we know the Spanish were the second ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. And we know this and we know spain kicks out is, is kicking out african moors when uh the moors lose control of um uh granada january 2nd 1492 and some of those african moors are being taken into spanish colonies and enslaved okay so uh it, 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 go ahead interesting and clarifying the point and it, it, it is uh, uh he's he's hit the nail on the head he's referring to the rise of fascism mm -hmm. and that created World War II chaos. And the first of the fascists were the, uh, the, the Spanish. They, they came.
came in to try to uh, uh, find their way, and then we had the Germans and the and the uh, Italians. So there, there is something to looking at these different European predator nations and how they feel that they can use uh, African people for super exploitation. Right. And so I think that the brother is, is trying to yeah. play up. But the global, there's a global attack on African peoples, and everybody takes advantage of it. Even, I was trying to say, a most insignificant nation, Belgium, there's not much there. <laughs> But they were able to get control of the Congo, the richest part of the real estate on the planet, and super exploited. And so the European owes us a debt that can, that can never be repaid. But we have to put the uh, the bill of, of, of particulars on the world table. And uh, as you talk about recovering for this and that and that and this, uh, the Africans have very sound ground in these various uh, uh, historical periods of claiming uh, that they have been abused and, and misused. And it, it should be over. Right. And uh, fortunately, uh, some of our strong congressional people, they got to be in there to fight for us. And and, uh, and, and hopefully they will. But, uh, but with this Trump uh, mentality and phenomena mm-hmm. of, of the, the new Nazis are uh, coming there <laughs> behind, but doing the same thing that the Nazis could destroy black people and people of color. So we, we have to keep our eyes open, right, uh, and be prepared. Exactly. Uh, well, 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 brother. Sure. Well, yeah, brother. Speaking of over, the show is over. Let people know quickly uh, how they can get in contact with you, how they can follow you, and then we have to wrap it up. We're out of time here. Go, go ahead, Doctor J. How can people get in contact with you if they want to yeah. have you do lectures or what have you? Modern technology uh, and uh, using the Zoom and also the YouTube. You, you, and that's why Happy has been so successful uh-huh. because they've been able to use um, this new technology. But uh, the, the Jeffries and the work that I'm doing in Brother Smalls and others uh, is, is there. If anybody wants to personally contact me, the telephone number here is 201 837. One three five five, and uh, two, again two zero one eight three seven. One three five five, and that we can, we'll be glad we uh, have an associate or an assistant, Charles, and he can connect you with some of these uh, this important material that we're talking about. And he's constantly, uh, even tonight, he showed my wife and I how right. uh, we can look at. You know, look at some of this important stuff that you've been taking advantage of, fortunately, uh, for uh, uh, a, a decent time. Some of us are just getting into uh, how we can use the technology. To right. All right, Dr. J, they're playing the music. We're out of time, man. This is only a two hour show. We're out of time. We're gonna bring you back on very soon. All right, take care, brother. Have a good good night. Tell Dr. Uh, Ross and Jeffries, I said Hotep also, okay? Okay, all right, Madasi. Absolutely. Struggle continues. Okay. Uh, everybody watching on Facebook and YouTube, uh, keep watching. We're going to keep broadcasting for a couple more minutes. The African History Network on Facebook, Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. Uh, right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. Hold on. Stand by. Okay. All right, how's everybody doing? Uh, okay, we've got uh, people watching. Okay, vi- uh, so we have the screening here in uh, Detroit. Okay, uh, this is going to be uh, Sunday, September 26 of the film Hot P, and this kicks off the Hot P tour. They're, they're hitting different cities. The tour starts uh, September 26 in Detroit, 3 p.m. Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. We have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can also visit Hapi.com, HapiFilm.com. They have information there for screenings in your city also, in different cities. Click on Hapi Film. We have the link at our website. I'll be moderating the panel discussion here in Detroit. Uh, when you go to their website here, they have... Uh, 
uh, September 26, Detroit. Uh, October 23rd, Atlanta. They're going to Philadelphia, Houston, Washington, D.C., Bridgeport. Okay, scroll down. Click right here for tickets for Detroit. Tickets in Detroit are 25 I think they're $25, $25 in Detroit. That covers the uh, – it's 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. That covers the screening and the uh, discussion. Charles H. Wright, Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, 315 East Warren Avenue, Detroit, Michigan. Okay, so we hope to see you all there. Now, also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, be sure to register for the um, new 10-week online course that I teach on Saturdays. We're going to deal with some of the uh, information we were talking about um, today with Dr. J. And we're looking at history uh, that leads up to the U.S. Civil War uh, taking place starting April 12, 1861 when the civil war starts we look at what leads up to the civil war taking place things like the mexican-american war um 1846 to 1848 texas becoming a state in the union uh in 1845 uh manifest destiny texas winning its independence from mexico 1836 compromise of 1850s fugitive slave act of 1850 republic the kansas nebraska act of 1854 um uh, the Republican Party being founded in 1854, the Bleeding Kansas campaign from about 1855 to 1859, where you have pro-slavery and anti-slavery groups, armed groups fighting and shooting and killing each other in the Kansas Territory. Um, Lincoln being uh, elected November 6, 1860, president-elect for the Republican Party. South Carolina seceding from the Union December 20th, 1860. Um, Civil War starting uh, April 12, 1861 in South Carolina. Uh, we go through and we look at the Civil War, but especially 1865, 40 Acres and the Mule, Special Field Order, special field order Number 15, Lincoln's Assassination, April, 60, uh, April 1865, um, Juneteenth, June 19, 1865, December 6, 1865, the 13th Amendment ratified. And then we go through the Reconstruction era, 1865 to 1877. Um, we look at the Freedmen's Bureau, Freedmen's Bank, the collapse of the Freedmen's Bank in 1874. And we, we look at these laws and policies that were put in place to suppress the African-American vote, to terrorize the domestic terrorism against African-Americans, even during Reconstruction, but especially after Reconstruction ends and the Compromise of 1877. Uh, then we look at the Jim Crow era. We look at uh, the suppression of the African-American vote. 1889, the first poll tax uh, takes place. It takes place in Florida. Then you have poll taxes in Mississippi, 1890. You're going to have uh, South Carolina. Uh, these, these southern states are changing their state constitutions. Uh, Mississippi State Constitution, 1890. South Carolina State Constitution, 1895. Louisiana State Constitution, 1898. Alabama State Constitution 1901, and they're instituting poll taxes, literacy tests, in some cases um, stating that uh, men have to own property to be able to vote and they're cracking down on the African-American vote. There were about 2000 elected officials that uh, 2000 African-American elected officials that were elected during Reconstruction era. And these southern states are reimposing white supremacy. So then we take you through the uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, uh, Williams, Williams versus Mississippi, 1898. U.S. Supreme Court case was case was challenges the state constitution, the Mississippi 1890. Um, we look at uh, World War One, World War Two, civil rights movement, the Black Power movement, to see what happened to us after slavery ended. What were the laws and policies put in place to put us in a predicament we're in right now to understand where we need to go from here as well? Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. And the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, the adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. So this is what this class focuses on. So we do this class normally on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the class live. All of the sessions are recorded. All the sessions are recorded, so you don't have to worry if you miss class or anything like that. You can go back and watch it anytime. As soon as you register, you can watch the um, class we just did uh, today and class we did last weekend. And I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, et cetera. Uh, there's also six bonus lectures that you get from me included with this. So this class is regularly $130. It's on 70, it's on sale $70 for a very limited time only. You can register right now. Go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. 
click on click on register here it takes you to the next page click on enroll as soon as you enroll you can start watching the content all right also if you like this type of information you can support the african history network dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show this helps us keep doing the research we are six days a week monday through friday 11 p.m to midnight uh eastern standard time and then sundays 9 p.m 11 p.m eastern standard time uh so this helps us keep doing the research stay on the air keep broadcasting pay some of the bills etc and this is our official cash app account dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w when you go to it it'll show my name michael and show my picture there these other ones are fake african history network cash app accounts um and then lastly we have a new section of the uh, other online course that i teach uh ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school okay so this is going to uh start up uh sunday september 26 and we deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place okay and we do this class live also all the sessions are recorded you can go back and watch it anytime so this class is on sale 80 dollars regularly 130 dollars and we deal with uh the history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade uh we deal with ancient africa ancient kemen ancient egypt now valley region of africa Ghana, Songhai, Mali, 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And we deal with the transatlantic slave trade also. Uh, Dr. Jeffries was just talking about Spain and John called in talking about Spain and um, Cuba, Haiti and Jamaica have all been in the news recently. And these are all three uh, islands or island countries conquered by Christopher Columbus in his four voyages of 1492 and 1494 and these countries are still feeling the effects of what of being conquered by columbus on behalf of spain a little more than 500 years ago about 520 530 years ago these countries have not recovered from being conquered by spain and being enslaved by spain okay they're still feeling the repercussions to this day of what happened 500 years ago okay so you can register for that one as well all right um okay look we got to get out of here we'll be back tomorrow uh remember at the african history network we focus on educating empowering and inspiring people of african descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior it's not over till we win we're kind of forever and we'll talk to you uh tomorrow uh, on our website we have the information for the radio show and when we're on and then the, the show is also an audio podcast format uh on iheart radio download the iheart radio app search for the african history network show and wherever you get your podcast from search for the african history network show we're on that we're on 10 different audio podcast platforms itunes Castbox, fm player stitcher iheart radio is a bunch of them um audio podcasts across the country they, they listen to me in south it was south korea I got a notification saying that they listen to my podcast in South Korea as well. But we have the information here uh, for the audio podcast also. All right, right now, this, right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win.